Welcome to Research Perch from the Massage Therapy Foundation. Short, practical insights into massage therapy research and how it can benefit your practice. Hello everyone, this is Doug Nelson, the president of the Massage Therapy Foundation, and welcome to another episode of Research Perch. In this episode, I have with me Lisa Belmore from Toronto, Canada. Thank you so much for joining us, Lisa. My pleasure, Doug. Yeah, and can you introduce yourself to everyone, please? Of course. Uh, so, well, my name is Lisa Belmore. I'm a shiatsu therapist. I've been in practice for nearly 20 years now. I live in Toronto, Canada, and uh, I work at an integrative clinic at Toronto Western Hospital. I'm Wonderful. also an international, international lecturer, and I've recently been uh, exploring the world of research. Awesome. Awesome. And thank you. I know that you've also been on the writing committee for the Massage Therapy Foundation. Thank you for your That's service. Right. My yeah. pleasure. Yeah. So um, I would like to know more when I looked up a little bit about uh, what we're going to talk about. I looked up the Al and Malka Green Artist Health Center, which is where you work. Oh my goodness, that sounds like an amazing place. It is pretty wonderful. Uh, I feel very honored to work there with such a wonderful uh, integrative collaborative team. Yeah. So t tell us about this, this artist center. And Lisa, your microphone's hitting against your necklace there. So you went with a, Sorry. <laughs> that's right. There you go. Great. Uh, yes. Well, the artist health center has been around for uh, just under 20 years, I think about 17 years. And I've been there for 10 years now. We have a, a wonderful range of disciplines. So we have both medical practitioners and complementary practitioners. And we work in a very collaborative manner. There's a lot of cross referrals and a lot of uh, conferencing on, on different patients. We have, uh, we have a doctor who does uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. We have a psychiatrist, a nurse practitioner, a social worker who does psychotherapy, a psychotherapist, uh, a registered dietitian, a naturopathic doctor, a chiropractor who also does cranial sacral therapy and acupuncture, a physiotherapist, a massage therapist, and myself doing shiatsu. Wow. That's, I think that's it. And soon a speech language pathologist as well. Wow. And our clinic specializes in providing um, care for the entire artistic community. So uh, we see writers, dancers, musicians, stagehands, lighting designers, uh, graphic designers, anyone who works in the arts or teaches in the arts is eligible to come to our clinic. Wow. Wow. You know, that is so amazing on, on two fronts, one of which is the places that I'm familiar that do music medicine, you know, that kind of thing, you know, are only working with performing uh, artists in the music world, but to have something that is overarching in art in general, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with any place that is doing the same thing. It's very rare. Yeah, you're right. There are clinics specifically for musicians and one specifically for dancers as well. Sure. But none that that really um, address the needs of the entire artistic community it's quite rare wow and they do have regardless of their discipline they do have very specific health needs uh, that they often don't feel are met by the um by the the regular healthcare community i suppose yeah, yeah. Gosh, that is so wonderful. And the fact that you have rather like Noah's Ark for healthcare, you know, so many different disciplines all working together in a truly collaborative and integrative way is, is really remarkable. What a wonderful thing. I'm so glad to know about this. Mm -hmm. And thanks to some of our donors, we have a subsidy program as well. So uh, those with limited income can access the subsidy fund for our fee-for-service uh, treatments. Wow. You know, last night I was just watching this documentary um, uh, that Yo-Yo Ma uh, was featured in and so he was with these indigenous people and they were doing this, um, just, just this amazing ritual and they have this lovely, um, you know, artistic aspect to their life and he said, you know, in essence, why do you do this? And this person said, because it gives meaning to our lives. Like, wow. Um, so, so cool. Thank you so much for your dedication to working with the arts. And, and also, so your background in shiatsu, um, it's my understanding that you've also uh, done some research studies in this as well, correct? 
Hmm. Yes, the first study I was a co-investigator on was published in 2014. And myself and some of the, the same members of our team have done a couple of other studies more recently that are now in review. So hopefully will be published soon. Okay. And uh, in all of them, we used hand self shiatsu to, um, to, well, hopefully to promote sleep. Uh, so the first pilot study was with people with chronic pain who had self-reported sleep problems. And the two more recent ones, one was with adolescents with chronic pain, and the third one was with military members and veterans and their families. Mm. Interesting. So, and, so, so, and this was using self-treatment, um, so self-shiatsu on the hands? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it points on both the dolar, dorsal, dorsal and volar surfaces of the hand. And uh, yeah, um, well, for sleep problems, non-pharmacological interventions are really needed. Yes. And uh, something like this puts the user in control. So uh, I think that's really valuable. It increases their feelings of control and their feelings of mastery and enhances their self-efficacy, which of course improves their quality of life. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a, so much research about that in terms of, you know, one of the most common, I, I think for people in pain, two things come up, invalidation and then loss of control. So in this way, something that they feel like they can do, that must be a really important contribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, people with chronic pain in particular uh, feel a real lack of control, but with other health conditions as well. Mm -hmm with other chronic health conditions. So yeah, I think it's uh, this idea of teaching people how to better care for themselves is really important. And I think all of us as therapists have a role to play in that. Yeah. So what kinds of things, like in the, say the first study with pain, what kinds of things were you measuring? Was it qualitative? Was it quantitative? How did you do that? Right, well, we had uh, measured both objective sleep measures and uh, subjective. So we used a number of validated standardized self-report measures, as well as in terms of objective, we used an actigraphy, which is a, a device similar to a wristwatch that people wear and it measures different sleep parameters. So um, sleep latency, you know, how long it takes them to fall asleep, the number of nighttime awakenings, uh, measures daytime light levels as well, things like that. So we measured, we used that at baseline to measure for one week and then we did, had two follow-up periods. Uh, we use the same sort of idea in the second two studies. And we didn't see major, we didn't see any real changes in the objective data, mm -hmm. um, but we did in the subjective in all three studies. In the first study, we did see that the number of minutes awake had decreased at the second, at the first follow up period when um, adherence to the protocol was a little higher. Um, so we saw, I'm trying to remember exactly how many minutes, it, it wasn't a huge number, but there was a difference. They, they were awake for a slightly less time. Yeah. But the self-report measures were what was striking. We did see statistically significant changes in those and uh, found that people, you know, their sleep disturbance had improved. Mm -hmm. uh, they also, in the, in the third study with military members, when they, we also had some uh, open-ended questions in the final follow-up period and they reported that they felt more rested and they felt felt they were sleeping better they felt their sleep quality had improved and there was self-reported measures are, are really important yeah. um, it would be nice to see improvements in the objective data as well but the fact that we did see statistically significant improvements in the subjective matters is important as well yeah that's always such an interesting aspect to, to research endeavors. I mean, there's this um, in the, you know, the subjective and the objective, uh, you know, I keep thinking back to many of the studies in delayed onset muscle soreness, where the things that were measured didn't change that much. But you, if you ask athletes, they think it made a significant, you know, difference and were mm -hmm. uh, and emphatic about that. And, and in the end, that matters, right? So it's relegating those two things, but I think it's important to collect both. And over time, it kind of guides us. And 
and maybe there are things that we just need to learn how to measure better or um, you know there's this uh, in kind of the philosophy of research there's something called post positivism which is something is can be known but we we struggle to find it and then there's the kind of the constructivism where it's like people's experience really matters and they're just mm -hmm. different physical um, philosophical ways to approach this so um, but it what people feel and think matters in this of course ever, yeah and it impacts it's their different. entire life right it yeah. it it has a an effect on their on their outlook which again has an effect on their their physical their psychological health yeah. um, it's huge yeah it's it yeah. really it's about the patient experience <laughs> yeah he, uh, absolutely so um the the little protocol that you had people do how long did it take them to do that it took uh, between 10 and 15 minutes the mm -hmm. for the first study i think it was closer to 15 and then we cut it we pared it down slightly that was based on participants feedback they, mm -hmm. they felt they would be happier if it had taken a bit less time yeah uh, so I'd say probably on average about 12 minutes mm -hmm. and we had asked participants to do it once they were in bed ready to go to sleep with the lights out so um, yeah we did reasons that they gave us for not completing the protocol were sometimes things like I fell asleep while doing it <laughs> uh, <yeah>. oh <laughs> very great positive yeah. to hear that yeah um, yeah but we did see, uh, you know, people, the majority of the people in our studies said that they would recommend it to other people. That's good. Uh, yeah, they felt it was a very positive thing. They appreciated that it was something they could do themselves. Uh, they appreciated that it was a non-drug therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, they, so they were quite positive about it. Yeah. So the first study was with uh, a pain population right mm -hmm. and i'm assuming this was kind of a broad population and then the second study was with am i to understand this correctly adolescents yes adolescents with pain with yeah persistent pain and and how was the compliance with the adolescents you know it was reasonably good i don't remember specifically yeah. but when we did uh the first follow-up period i think a hundred percent of them said they were using the protocol although it wasn't every single night that they were doing it. Yeah. Uh, but they were using it. And uh, we did see, I think in all studies, we saw at the second follow-up period that the adherence was a little less than it had been at the first follow-up period. Sure. It's natural. <laughs> yeah, right, right. The novelty factor wears off a little bit. So yeah. um, and how long were you uh, following these people? Like what was the duration of the study? The first one we did a follow-up period at two weeks and at eight weeks or okay. six weeks uh yeah. and the second two studies we did at four and eight weeks okay so so you started the protocol and then you checked in with them at four weeks is that what i'm saying? yeah okay got it yes yeah. so they were we did a, a week of baseline measures then they were taught the protocol they had a follow-up phone call to ensure they had no questions i think a week later oh, nice. and then then we did measurements again at two, uh, sorry, at four weeks, and then at eight weeks with the second two studies. Yeah. So, and that, and the third study was with uh, military veterans. Is that correct? Yes, active military members, veterans, and their families. Wow. Wow. Uh, and uh, it was a slightly larger study. We had fifty participants in that study, mm -hmm. uh, thirty in the control in, in the intervention group, and uh, twenty in the control. The control recruitment was unfortunately cut short because of the pandemic. Um, yeah. So, um, so that that had an effect, of course, on our results. But yeah, uh, yeah again, we did see those subjective improvements, and um, and we did for that study receive a quite a generous grant from uh, Veterans Affairs Canada. So we were able to create a website to uh, house our resources. So we have a video teaching the hand self shiatsu routine. We have a handout they can download as well and uh, an app for smartphones. Oh my goodness. That uh, includes the videos. So they're available, widely available to anyone uh, for free. Wow. And uh, I'm in the process of doing knowledge dissemination around that and uh, getting the word out about it. Yeah, so, so these resources were created for the study that are now available not only to other people in that kind of um, 
domain, but also to anyone that yep, who's asking? the general yeah. public. That's all. And Excellent. hopefully it's something that practitioners can share with their patients as well. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, Lisa, we will definitely post that uh, with this episode so okay. that we can share that. I think it's, um, again, for all the reasons we mentioned earlier about just self-care and self-efficacy, and um, it's really, really important that we share those kinds of resources. Mm -hmm. And um, so we'll post that as well with this. Great. I think it's also a great resource for practitioners for self-care, mm -hmm. not only for sleep problems, but it's uh, I always do self shiatsu on my hands before I have a busy day <laughs> at, uh -huh. at the clinic. And uh -huh. it, uh, it's wonderful. It just, you know, wonderful for injury prevention, keeping the hands safe and feeling good and great thing for manual therapists to use regularly. Awesome. awesome. Well, we'll, we'll um, include that with this as well. Mm -hmm. well. And going forward, Lisa, what are our goals and are there ideas for other studies or? There any? are. Well, we would like to do, the study with veterans was a, a non-randomized controlled study. We would like to do a larger randomized controlled study. Um, I'm currently working on a, 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 as a co-investigator on a systematic review of the safety and risks of shiatsu. And I've just completed my master's. Uh, so I have to write up uh, my thesis for publication. Um, wow. Yeah, I'm not sure what else is on the horizon, but uh, I really, I have an innate curiosity and I think that's what drives me to, <laughs> to want to do research. Yeah. Um, but I also, you know, there's a real limited evidence base for shiatsu. We're sort of, I think where massage therapy was maybe 30 years ago in terms mm -hmm. of research. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really would like to see that evidence base grown. So, yeah. um, as much as I can contribute to that, uh, I will. That's awesome. That's awesome. And um, yeah, I'm 30 years ago, that, there was kind of a dearth of, uh, you know, research literature for massage therapy. It's really grown, in, especially in the last, say, 10 or 15. Mm -hmm. So, um, but in the end, it all comes down, and I love what you said, that, you know, it's that innate curiosity and sense of wonder about the world. And that's really what, what drives everything. Yeah. I, I read a wonderful quote from uh, Commander Chris Hadfield recently, and uh, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but yeah. he had said that science is just formalized curiosity. Absolutely. And that just struck a chord with me. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's that sense of just wanting to have a deeper understanding about things. And from that deeper understanding, one can then formulate you know, effective, in our case, effective treatment protocols. And um, it just, it's always amazing to me that the, the deeper we get into it, the more there is this sense of wonder about it all, you know. And uh, for someone like yourself, uh, who's been in the field for so long, obviously, you must have a sense of wonder about it all, because it's mm -hmm. kept you in the field for a long time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and did, did you have an um, arts background coming into this? How is it? That I did. I worked in theater for about 12 years as a costumer. Uh, so I built costumes for stage and occasionally for film as well. And I did a bit of props making for film and set deck. And uh, it was wonderful. I loved it, but it was uh, time for a change. And mm -hmm. I think working with really fine, delicate fabrics for so many years uh, gave me a very heightened sense of touch. And uh, I think that, that has served me well in, in Shiatsu. And it also gave me an understanding of the autistic population that I work with. Yeah. Isn't it interesting, Lisa, how um, retrospectively all these pieces of our life, you know, um, mm -hmm. all play an important role and you can see how all of that construct creates who you are today and uh, you certainly are a wonderful example of that you know in the arts and um, also that tactile sense and which mm -hmm. you know about palpation and now giving back to the to the arts in a, in a different way which is really wonderful yeah. yeah so thank you so much for the work that you're doing and uh, and for exploring, you know, the, the research aspect of this and, and for making a difference in the arts. Um, you know, uh, somebody I heard yesterday say, uh, if you want to know in one sense about the importance of the arts, tell me who was king when Beethoven was, you know, 
composing. It's like, hmm. I don't know, right? <laughs> right. It, what we remember about a culture is largely through their arts. So uh, mm -hmm. thank you so much for, for making a difference and contributing to that as well. And I look forward to further conversations. And uh, someday I'm going to come and visit because I want to see the center. Excellent. Well, we do have a brand new space to show off. Wow. Yes. Okay, now, that's awesome. Uh, well, listen, thank you, Lisa. And for everyone, thank you so much for watching another episode of Research Perch. We'll put a couple of links to the resources that Lisa mentioned. And again, thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider donating to the Massage Therapy Foundation so that we can continue to bring you this and many other resources to increase your knowledge and improve your practice. Thank you.